we need to talk about energy requirements in skeletal muscles. So we've talked about how they do what they do, how they carry out contractions. Um, this is a process that certainly uses energy. We know that there's ATP involved in forming those cross bridges. And so um, what else requires ATP in this whole process? Well, about 70% of the energy requirements for skeletal muscles goes to just myosin doing what it does, myosin binding to actin and then undergoing that power stroke that uses ATP every time it happens. But we also have things going on with ions, right? We've learned about calcium. Calcium has to flood out of the SR and then uh, after the contraction is done, it has to be pumped back in. So there's certainly some energy use um, going in right there just in terms of pumping the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then we also have the normal sodium potassium pumps um, which are necessary for just maintaining the membrane polarity so those are the major requirements in, in terms of um, ATP consumption in skeletal muscles where do muscles get ATP so this is going to tie in with digestion of course we're consuming uh, food and from the food ultimately is where we get our energy um, but just looking at the energy stores throughout the body. So if a person is at rest or exercising very lightly, um, we know from earlier in the semester that muscles um, make very efficient use of fatty acids. So this is the, the typical energy source um, shown on the graph here in yellow. These are the fatty acids that are in, in the blood. Um, skeletal muscles primarily use this energy source when they are at rest. If we are exercising, uh, moderate intensity exercise, then there's an interesting shift that takes place. Yes, our skeletal muscles are still using fatty acids, but they also, also start to consume more um, glycogen. So our muscles and our livers um, store glycogen, just the stored form of glucose. And during moderate intensity exercise, Okay, uh, you can see in purple here, those glycogen stores really start to get tapped into. So this is a shift that takes place depending on the intensity of the exercise. Why is there this shift taking place? Why do muscles switch to using glycogen more than fatty acids? Um, well, it has to do in part with just the, the accessibility. So fatty acids take a little bit more work to break down. And if a muscle is in the process of using a lot of energy, it's going to use the, the quickest energy source it can find. And that is glucose. Um, so glycogen, if you'll recall the structure of glycogen, glycogen is this really branched, um, it, it's a polymer, it's got um, lots of glucoses attached together, and it's in a highly branched structure. And that structure is really easy for enzymes to be able to go in and just kind of cleave off individual glucose units. So it's a quick source of energy. Glucose then can head into cellular respiration um, and be broken down to, to fuel those ATP uh, synthase, I think of the word there, ATP synthases that are in the electron transport chain. So uh, that's for moderate intensity and also heavy exercise. Uh, also we use a lot of glycogen stores. The heavier the exercise, the more glucose transport molecules get inserted into the membranes. So this is going back from um, a little ways back in, in the course, we talked about how glucose uh, transport carriers are just stored in vesicles near the plasma membrane, and then they can be inserted into the plasma membrane when they're needed. Heavy exercise is one of the things that can facilitate that insertion into the membrane. So that helps to bring in even more glucose from the plasma because those carrier proteins have been inserted into the membrane. So then, uh, next question. Okay, so after you've been exercising for a while, right, and then you stop, you're still breathing heavy. And why is that the case? Ultimately, the, the increase in respiration rate while you're exercising, that's just to provide more oxygen, which in turn helps to allow cellular respiration to take place. It allows us to make ATP more quickly. Um, but after we're done exercising, why do we still it's still have an increased breathing rate. There are a few reasons for this. Um, overall, throughout the body, there's what's called an oxygen debt, and that debt is being repaid. Um, so while we're exercising, oxygen is actually sort of, it's like it's withdrawn from the reserves. So we've got hemoglobin all throughout the body. We're gonna see this in the next chapter. Hemoglobin um, in the blood, 
and normally there's a little bit of excess oxygen just stored in hemoglobin. While we're exercising, we start to tap into those reserves. So they start to get depleted. When we're done exercising, um, we have to continue to breathe a little bit more heavily just so that that reserve gets built back up. So that's one reason. Um, and then a couple of other things to keep in mind here. So remember, we've talked about ions, that calcium has to get pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So even though like we're done exercising, um, even so there's still some energy requirements going on just to sort of reset the muscles back to, to their original resting condition. So we continue breathing for a little while, um, even after, continue breathing heavily for a little while, even after we're done exercising. All right, um, talking about intense exercise. All right, it is totally possible for muscles to run out of ATP when we're exercising intensely. And uh, what happens? It's not like your muscles just quit working altogether. There's a mechanism in place to deal with this fact. Um, so muscles, skeletal muscles in particular, skeletal muscles have a special reserve um, on hand to provide high energy phosphate molecules if needed. And the molecule that allows muscles to do this is called phosphocreatine. So creatine Creatine is something that is produced by the liver um, and the kidneys. It's also something that you can obtain a little bit of in the, in the diet, but mostly it's made by the liver and kidneys. And creatine, just when we're at rest, so not exercising, but when we're at rest, what happens with creatine is that uh, a phosphate group can be attached to it. So what our bodies do at rest is they take an ATP molecule, they split off a phosphate from it, and they attach that to creatine. That forms phosphocreatine. And then this is the molecule that gets stored in our skeletal muscles. Now, during exercise, during intense exercise, if our muscles can't keep up with ATP production by cellular respiration, then what they will do is tap into this phosphocreatine molecule. So phosphocreatine can be cleaved um, just separated back out into its components, creatine and phosphate. And that is a high energy phosphate that can be used to form ATP. So this is a quick way to get, um, get more ATP, which then in turn can allow cross bridge formation and muscle contraction to take place. So this is something that's really special for, uh, for muscles. This is also something that we can look at um, sort of as a, I don't think diagnostic is the right word, but it can be, uh, the presence of this molecule can be an indication, creatine, the presence of this in the blood can be an indication of um, things that might be going wrong. We'll be revisiting this when we come back to um, talking about the kidneys later on in the semester. And so for right now, just know about this in the context of muscles. Phosphocreatine is a reserve for high energy phosphate, which can help to power muscle contractions. There's an enzyme that helps with both producing and breaking down phosphocreatine. Um, it is a kinase, right? Makes sense because it's involving um, attaching a phosphate group, attaching and removing. So that's a kinase that does that job. Okay, so uh, sometimes if people are trying to build up their muscles, sometimes they will take creatine supplements. And this is something, this is kind of interesting. So what this does, if someone takes creatine as a supplement, um, this can help to boost up the reserves of phosphocreatine in the muscles. And in very short term exercise um, rounds, like if you do short intense exercise, this can help to boost abilities. It can make the muscles perform better in the short term. Um, not so much for long term exercise. It doesn't really seem to help um, if you're doing longer duration exercise. And then the other thing to just to keep in mind with supplements like this, um, these can have negative consequences on the liver and sometimes the kidneys. Um, those are the primary organs that deal with sort of processing these extra materials that we put into the body. Um, and then the other thing that creatine does is it um, tends to recruit water, so the muscle cells tend to sort of bulk up a little bit, they swell up a little bit, and so the muscles look look bigger, um, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with, with more strength, right? It's just because there's more water present in the muscles. 
Muscle fatigue. Okay, so what is it that causes muscles to fatigue? Well, the most obvious answer to that is just if they run out of energy, right? So if they're lacking in ATP, then they're not going to be able to contract as much or as, as strongly. Um, but there are a couple of other reasons that can contribute to muscle fatigue as well. If the glycogen stores start to run short, then that's another reason why ATP might end up being in short supply. Um, but we can also look at reasons having to do with ions, just if the, if the ion balance haven't had a chance to reaccumulate where they need to um, that can result in muscle fatigue as well and then there's also uh, there's a whole other sort of fatigue that has to do with the neurons getting fatigued so maybe it's not actually the muscle cell itself but maybe it's the neuron that is su supposed to be stimulating that muscle so different reasons for muscle fatigue um, when we exercise regularly we know that our muscles do start to adapt we, we get stronger over time if we continue to exercise exercise um, and we're able to carry on exercise for longer periods of time. What's responsible for that? How do muscles adapt um, during exercise training? Well, for one thing, they start storing more energy reserves. Um, so in intracellularly inside of the cells, they will start storing more triglycerides. So that's an energy reserve, right? That's the first energy reserve that's used during light exercise. Um, and then they also, this is one that you may know from intro biology courses, when you exercise a lot, your mitochondria are stimulated to divide. So they divide and multiply, and that's just ultimately helping the cell to be able to produce more ATP. Okay, the muscle fibers um, themselves can also be modified. We can change the number and the type of muscle fibers. We're not going to be getting into different types of muscle fibers in this class. That's a little bit more of a detailed um, detailed discussion. If you're going into kinesiology, you'll, you'll be seeing this more. Uh, but we do have different types of muscle fibers. They're sort of specialized for different tasks. Anyway, muscles can be modified over time as a result of um, of, of regular exercise being done.